So I want to tease out, um, again, some of these different philosophies and think about these different philosophies. Um, and they're right across the top here as they get lived out in different ways that we understand communion. Um, so the first philosophy I want to talk about, uh, and to just give a very practical example, have a little bit of fun with this, is if I were to say to you all, <clears throat> what is this right here? What would you say? Chair. It's chair. Kathy thinks this is a chair. A stool. And you're going to go with a stool. Right. So if I were to ask you to describe, we'll just call it a stool, right? If I were to ask you to describe this stool, let's just do this small group approach here. Uh, how would you begin to describe this stool? What are some words that you use to describe this stool? Padded. It's padded, right? It's padded. What else would you describe this stool? Four legs. It's got four legs, right? What else would you use to describe this stool? It's sturdy. It seems to be pretty sturdy. What color is it? Kind of a beige, I don't know what you call that. What do you call it? I'm not good at colors, but sort of beige. Now let me ask you a question. If I pulled out a can of spray paint and I painted this black, would it still be a stool? If I painted it red, would it still be a stool? What if I cut off one of the legs? Would it still be a stool? It would be a three-legged stool, but it could potentially be a stool. So the thing you're sitting on right now, all of you, is that a stool? So what makes a stool different than a chair? Chair's got a back, so the stool doesn't necessarily have a back. So let me just make, a, make sure I got this straight. If I painted this a different color, it'd still be a stool. If it was not padded, it would still be a stool, right? If it was made out of metal, it still potentially could be a stool. In other words, what I'm getting at is there's something about a stool that gives a stool its stoolness. Forgive my jargon, get the idea. I can turn the same thing around and say there's something about a chair that gives a chair its chairness, right? Uh, well, there's a philosopher by the name of Aristotle that actually gloms on to this understanding and says everything innately has a substance to it. There's something about a stool that everybody knows that's a stool. And whether it's brown, whether it's black, whether it's red, whether it's padded, whether it's not padded, Aristotle called these things accidents. Everybody track with me so far? So everything has a substance to it. It's stoolness, right? And everything has a matter of accident, or accidents in the plural. Now, take the philosophy of Aristotle and, and apply it to the understanding of the Lord's Son. Uh, let's just look at the Lord's Supper for a second. So if you have your Bibles there, look at 1 Corinthians 15. Um, Lord's Supper here mentioned a few times in the New Testament. We get it in the Gospel accounts. We also get it in Paul's first letter to the Corinthians, chapter 11. Let's just look at this here. So 1 Corinthians chapter 11. And if you date Corinthians and you date the Gospels, most scholars would agree that Corinthians comes first, and then the Gospels. So what we have here in Corinthians 11 is probably one of the earlier accounts, at least in the canon of Scripture, with regard to the Lord's Supper. Make sense? Probably one of the earliest accounts right here in Corinthians 11. So look at 1 Corinthians 11, verse 23. And let me just read this and, and see what you pick up here. For I received from the Lord what I also handed unto you. The Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took a loaf of bread... When he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body that is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And of course, the million-dollar answer, the million-dollar question is, What do you do with it? What does this mean? Welcome to 2,000 years post-Paul, right? And post Lord's Supper, we try to figure that out. So back to Aristotle. What happens when you take that understanding of the Supper through Aristotle's, excuse me, Aristotle's lens of substance and accidents? What do you end up with? And what you end up with is predominantly this view over here. Translation. 
transubstantiation. Transubstantiation is, if you will, the substance in the Lord's Supper, for instance, uh, we take bread. So what happens in the Mass? The bread, the substance of the bread, is actually changed, transubstantiated, into what? What happens with the bread? It becomes the body of Christ. What happens to the wine? The substance of the wine is actually changed. This is, this is the philosophy of Aristotle. The substance is actually changed from wine into what? Blood. The blood of Christ, right? So philosophy of Aristotle, wine becomes blood. Bread becomes body. But what do you do with the fact that it appears anyway? It sure smells like wine. It sure tastes like I'm not eating, I'm, not, I'm being reverently, I'm just trying to drive a point home here. Uh, it sure tastes like bread. How would Aristotle understand the face, understand the reality that sure smells like wine, sure tastes like bread? Aristotle would say what? These are merely accidents. Merely accidents. Make sense? So I have this whole understanding of substance and accident. This is the predominant view within the Roman Catholic Church today and the Orthodox Church today. Little difference. This is interesting to know. Little difference between the Orthodox understanding, little, and Roman Catholic view. The Orthodox view, you don't get quite as hard when you really fine tooth comb this puppy. You don't get quite the push, if you will, or understanding uh, with the Aristotelian metaphysic that you do in the Roman view. Interesting on this. Luther grows up with this. This is what Luther cuts his teeth on. And most scholars, when they look back, Paulson does a good job of looking this up, right, to take a look at this. Luther doesn't necessarily have necessarily an issue with the metaphysics. He has an issue with how it is being misused in his time. In his time. Let's look at the other side of the coin. We're going to go over here for a second. That's consubstantiation, predominantly philosophically through uh, the lens of Aristotle. We're going to shift gears over here. Let me tell you a story. How are we doing on time? Yeah. Oh, we're good. Yeah. <laughs> I'll check out my time before I quit. So we, let me tell you a little story. So my mother, raising three boys, and my loving father, um, my mother, a very frugal woman, uh, her background grew up in a um, pretty stoic German family. Uh, they, pinched, they pinched the dime. And uh, when well, my mother, even this day, very, very frugal, very frugal person, could feed three really hungry boys on a pretty small budget. I don't know how they did it, but they did it. And when she would go shopping, at least when we were kids, I know think times have changed, but when we were kids, we never had pop around the house. We never, we'd call it pop or soda, depending on what side of the Mississippi River you grew up on, right? <laughs> And so we never had that stuff. And so to get pop or to get soda was a real treat. So every once in a while, my mother, when she'd go to the grocery store, not very often, maybe twice a year, would buy pop for three boys to enjoy. Not for a long time, but she might get like a can <laughs> or two. That was it. That was your six months fix so that you had to wait another six months to get another can of pop or soda pop. And so what do you think a frugal German woman, mother, uh, what kind of pop? you think she buys uh, when you go to the grocery store? Just take a long guess. Not a brand name. Not a brand name, right? And so everybody knows that if you're going to go with the real cola, everybody knows what the real cola is. What's the real cola? There is only one real cola. It's, of course, Coke. Coke is the real thing. Pepsi is just a happy try to imitate, right? Coke is the real deal. So what does the frugal German mom buy when she goes to the grocery store. She's not gonna buy you the real thing. She's not gonna buy Coke. You know what she buys? She buys Shasta. You ever had Shasta? Shasta root beer, not so bad. Shasta grape, not so bad. I gotta tell you though, Shasta cola, <laughs> it's yeah. the worst, it's horrible. It's nothing like the real thing. It's an imitation, right? It's symbolic. <laughs> It points to the real thing, saying, I sure hope I taste like Coke, but I can never measure up to being Coke. 
This is chiefly the view of the great philosopher Plato. In other words, there can only be one real thing at a time. Just one. Plato would say, that's Russ Schultz right there. There can only be one Russ, not multiple Russes, only one Russ. And Russ can only be in one place at one time, period. That's the human condition. Make sense? So what happens if you take a platonic understanding of the Lord's Supper? What does it look like? Through the lens of Plato, what's the Lord's Supper look like? Jesus said, took bread, said, this is my body given for you. Platonic understanding would say what? It's not really body. It's bread. Jesus was saying in the Lord's Supper, what? This is representing my body. This is symbolic of my body. So as you eat this bread, as you drink this cup, it is symbolic of my body and of my blood. By the way, do this in remembrance of me. Why in remembrance of me? I'll flesh that out a little bit more. Because I'm not here anymore. From a platonic understanding through that philosophy, where's Jesus? Certainly ain't on earth. Where's Jesus? By the way, the early believers had to wrestle with this same question. Where's Jesus? He's up in... <laughs> Ever notice that we say heaven? We always go up in heaven. Does heaven have a direction? But yet we sometimes do this, don't we? He's up in heaven with the Father and the Holy Spirit. But there will only be one Jesus, and Jesus... This is the predominant understanding of most of North America today with regard to the sacrament. Does that make sense? So the sacrament is merely symbolic. It's representative. But it's not the real, you're not really eating and drinking the real body and blood of Christ. It's merely symbolic of that. Does that make sense? Arguably, this is probably the, this is probably the most prevalent understanding of the sacrament today, especially in North America. So, two views that we've looked at right now. We're going to now, after a pause here, we're going to come back and take a look at the Lutheran understanding.